Good morning, everyone. My name is Katie Courtney. I am studying counseling psychology under Tara Wiedemeyer, which I would like to thank for being here. Tara is a licensed professional counselor, and she has just really helped me out, and I, I just want to thank her for pouring her knowledge into me this year. All about me. I am a senior at Frisco High School. Uh, I have one sister, Kendall, who's a freshman at Frisco this year. That's my family in the top right corner. I have a dog, Lenny, on the right, and a cat named Alice on the left. Uh, the way that I got into being interested in counseling psychology was learning about it from my aunt when I was a sophomore. Uh, she's a licensed professional counselor in Houston, Texas, and she told me about uh, what the job actually is and uh, everything that she does on a day-to-day -day basis, and I just got really interested in it. Uh, my personality is very outgoing, I'm a peace people person, I'm very caring, and I'm friendly. And so I could just never see myself sitting behind a desk every day in front of a computer and just going to work from 9 to 5 and just sitting there. And I just, I could never see myself doing that. Uh, I think I would get bored. And so after hearing about this, I just heard the enthusiasm that my aunt had for the profession. And it really got me interested um, because I just... I liked what, what she said about it, and I just thought that I could see myself doing it someday. So I took ISM to get real world experience to see what I had in mind um, for what I would be going into in college, because I didn't know if it was actually something that I was going to love. Uh, I had never had any experience about it, I, would just, I just heard about it. And so ISM has helped me get that real world, um, like how it's different from just hearing about it in day to day school life because being working with people in real life and helping them out and stuff is different than just sitting at your desk and hearing like, oh, well, this is what this is in and, and classes, so. My mission statement is to help patients become the best version of themselves possible through counseling. Um, it's also to help provide therapy to patients with the highest quality programs as possible to help the patient to become successful in daily life. My quote for this year is, if opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. At first, the reason that I chose this quote was because I did not really know anything about counseling psychology um, at all. And so I figured that since I didn't really know what, what it was, um, I would have to put myself out there and I would have to interview professionals and I'd have to build up that um, knowledge basis for myself. Um, throughout my way of ISM, I actually created more of a new meaning for that though. Because after talking to my mentor, um, the, one of the most important things about counseling is that you can only do so much for your client. Uh, if they're not willing to fix what they need to fix for themselves, then you really cannot do anything about it for them. You can only um, give them their treatment plans and their steps um, to a certain extent. Uh, but if they're not willing to change themselves, then you're not going to be able to change them. And it's very important to remember that. So if the opportunity doesn't knock um, for them, you just have to build their door up of their steps of what, how they can help themselves as well. The type of counseling that I'm most interested in is children and young adults, uh, about ages 8 to 17. At first, before ISM, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I, I mean, there's, and there's so many different ways that you can uh, do counseling psychology, whether it be marriage counseling or family or teenagers or kids or anything, honestly. Um, so after talking to my mentor, um, she kind of helped me figure out more what I would be more interested in. Uh, so I decided that I think that it would be better for me to work with uh, adolescents and young adults. Um, I'd like to work with people who battle depression, anxiety disorders, and possible substance abuse. Uh, you'll see in my original work that we did work with some substance abuse. Um, I'm not sure if I really want to like specialize in that, but I would definitely love to uh, see clients like that. So the first semester, the first thing we did in ISM was go and interview, uh, do blind interviews with professionals in our career field. My first interview with, uh, was with Elizabeth Beebe. Her office is in Frisco, Texas, and she has her own private um, 
her own private business. And so she was able to open it and she works through her church. So she does more Christian counseling. Uh, she sees more adults and couples. She said that whenever she was younger and first starting out, she saw more um, like teenagers and young adults, but she liked more going the way of couples therapy um, and even single adult therapy. She just likes the more mature uh, field of people. But she does specialize in marriage therapy. My next interview was with Christine Price in Allen, Texas. Uh, in her her office was a lot more different than what Elizabeth's was um, because she does she does work at a private practice but she works alongside other counselors as well so they all own it together they're like business partners but she really loves the family environment so like she was telling me that whenever she would have counseling sessions it depends on the client but she would bring her dogs in sometimes just to make the like to make the people a little more comfortable and just be able to be like, oh, like I can be relaxed here. It's not just some like doctor's office that is really scary. Um, she doesn't have a specific age that she works mainly with. It's honestly all over the board for her. Um, but she does specialize in anger management, which is which I thought was interesting because from doing my research and people to interview, um, I didn't see very much anger management specialized like specialization. Um, so I thought that it would be interesting to interview someone like that because whenever you think, oh, I'm going to counseling, you think, oh, I'm going for depression or something like that. But anger management, um, it was interesting to hear about the types of steps that she uses to help um, people who do go through that. My next interview was down in Dallas with Dr. Brad Schwal. And he owns his own private practice. And he has many counselors that work underneath him. Uh, but they do many different things. They, some of them work with insurance, some of them ha are secretaries, some of them are actual counselors. Um, so that was very interesting to me because that was the only interview that I had that he was, he was literally like the owner and he had many people working underneath him and it was, I mean it was a very, it was a small business. It was a real, um, very structured and everything. Uh, he was more centered towards the business side of things, so he enjoys more work. He does work with clients one-on-one, uh, -on -one, face to face, but he his more interest is in insurance and paperwork and uh, more running the business than being one of the employees. My next interview was with Matt McKinney in Frisco, Texas. Uh, I liked his office because it was very laid back and it was very comfortable and modern and you could just tell when you walk in, you could just be like, oh, I, I really like this place, like, I, I'm very comfortable here. Um, so he focuses more on adolescent boys and young men because he said that whenever he was younger, he didn't exactly have a father figure in his life. And so he, he's, he works with boys who don't really have a father figure, or if they do, it's not a strong father figure. Um, and he's also a Christian counselor, so he helps them um, through the work of the Bible, and he just... It's more of like a, he said it's like a brotherhood type of thing that he really likes um, to help the boys with. Uh, my next interview is with Tiffany Ashenfelter. And this interview is also very different because she does own her own private practice alongside her husband. And I, had not, I hadn't seen that before in anything um, because her and her husband literally do run their own business. Uh, she has her business in Dallas, Texas, uh, and then she likes to focus more on the business side of the occupation and less sit and talk all day. Uh, she said that her husband, she, he likes to do more of the face-to-face, -face, like talking to people, um, and then she likes to do like the paperwork and insurance, just like Dr. Bradshaw did. Um, and she said that they kind of feed off of each other because he, he will give his paperwork uh, to her and then she'll kind of help him with treatment plans and everything, so they just like... They work really well together, she said. Uh, her specialty, though, she does do face-to-face -face, um, client work also, which is uh, mostly with teenage girls who are battling anxiety and depression. My mentor is Tara Wiedemeyer. She is a pre-licensed professional, uh, LPC intern, and she's also a licensed chemical dependency intern. Uh, she works with mainly adolescents and adults, uh, it's kind of, there, she doesn't work with one specific uh, type of person. 
She went to uh, Texas Women's University and received her match master's in counseling and development there. And she utilizes her knowledge and skills in order to help people achieve their goals, gain better balance, and overcome difficulties, thus facilitating cognitive, emotional, and behavioral growth. Ms. Wiedemeyer uses research-based approaches and is trained in relaxation therapy, expressive arts, addiction, play therapy, and chemical and su substance abuse independency. She is committed to joining her clients on their journey to health and wholeness. She is passionate about life and people and creates a warm, safe, and creative environment. Something that I really love about her office is that she works along a psychiatrist. Um, so she's able to, if she needs to, she's able to refer clients out, but they still can go to her office. Uh, so it's more convenient for them. And her office is very homey. They play children's movies in the waiting room, and you walk into her office, and there's just a comfortable couch, and you can just tell that it's a, it's a very relaxed environment, um, which makes it easier for the client to be able to talk. On the left is a picture of my uh, mentor and I. And on the right is a picture of her and one of her sons. So in the first semester, we did a lot of research-based assessments. Uh, and the first one that I did was, what is a licensed professional counselor? Basically, I, I, looked, up this, um, I looked up this article because I knew kind of what it was, but I didn't know exactly what a licensed, prof licensed professional counselor was. Um, I learned that a licensed professional counselor actually has to go through 3,000 hours before they can be licensed, um, and they have to do that under a mentor uh, who ha also had to go through some training to do that as well. Uh, so that was interesting to learn because I had no idea that it took 3,000 hours <laughs> to, um, <laughs> to become licensed. Uh, my next one was family counseling because I had no idea what type of counseling I wanted to go into at the start of this either. So I looked up fam family counseling because you do hear about that very often. And I learned in family counseling you have some sessions with the entire family and you have some sessions with some siblings or some sessions with the parents. And so it's kind of more of a everyone works on their own and then you also have group sessions um, that kind of tie all of the sessions together in order for it to be uh, productive. And then my next research assessment was about play therapy. And play therapy is basically with younger children. And in order to get them to talk, sometimes you need to get them to do something that they're comfortable with. So basically what that means is that if they're comfortable with playing Barbie dolls, then you can have them play Barbie dolls. You play them with them. and they just start to talk and you can ask them some questions and they just feel more comfortable and it's it's kind of more of a comfortable environment than just sitting um, in a white room talking to a stranger. Um, my next research assessment was over one of the U University of North Texas classes that I attended called Therapeutic Play. And this class was a very small class and so it was, it was nice to hear from every single student that was in the class. Uh, which was very interesting to me. And in that class we talked about how it's very important to let a child do for themselves what they can do for themselves. So if it means that they can dress themselves, even if it doesn't match, you should let them dress themselves because it instills um, some more confidence in them, which uh, helps with their bringing up and everything. Uh, the next class that I sat in on in, at UNT was child development. And in child development, it was a very interesting class because whenever I took child development, you learn literally about their development. And um, at this class, it was much different because you learn more about how a child grows up uh, under what kind of parents they have. So whether it be um, mixed race parents, if they were straight parents, if they were gay or lesbian parents, it just each they had a group project that day that they were presenting, and each group had a different topic of like a different way that a child could be upbrought. So like single parent, married parent, just a, a ton of different things. So it was very interesting to see um, the research that they did and the statistics that they brought up um, from their sources um, to help show us what each type of upbringing could help or hurt a child. 
So next, uh, I did my original work with my mentor, and we decided that we would come up with a fake client uh, to create some type of recovery and treatment plan uh, for them to get back on the right track into their healthiest self. So for our, um, for the way that we figured it out was we just kind of thought like, oh, do we want it to be a girl or a boy? Do we want, how old do we want them to be? Um, do we want them to be a student? Do we want them to have uh, no education? Do we want them to be a college student? Do we want them to be an adult? So then we decided on Mason Freeman, who is a 16-year-old boy, and he is a student. So the first thing that you do whenever you see a client is you take their client intake form. Uh, it's very basic, and it's a standard type of form that you would fill out during the first appointment that you have with anyone, whether you go to the dentist or your pediatric uh, doctor or even your counselor. Uh, so if you're a minor, your parent or guardian has to fill it out. Here's our intake form for Mason Freeman. Uh, so it just has your basic things like what street he lives on, his phone number, his mom's information, uh, some permission things that his mom had to fill, fill out. Um, it has the religious pref uh, preference. Uh, it has who referred you there, as well as your doctor, um, some stressors. And uh, it also asks what would you like to accomplish during your time in therapy. And that's important because a lot of people just kind of go to therapy like blind and they don't really they don't really have anything for themselves because they think that the counselor will make them better even though that's not what happens at all. Um, so you'll see that since Mason is 16 and he's a minor, his mom and him had to sign. Uh, next we have informed consent. And this covers emergency, crisis, qualifications and supervision, counseling relationship boundaries, effects of counseling, client rights, referrals, cancellations, records and confidentiality, phone call policies, fees, court policies, and termination policies. Uh, there's a little bit of like a short paragraph after each one of these and the parent or guardian has to initial again if they're a minor um, but if they're not then the client just has to initial saying that they read it and they agree to it. Uh, HIPAA is the U.S. Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, and it's basically just privacy standards to protect the patient's medical records and other health information provided to health plans, doctors, hospitals, and other health care providers. So after you fill out all of the paperwork, uh, you, have, you go back with your counselor and you have the initial assessment. Um, and this is very important because it, it literally covers everything about yourself so that the counselor can kind of get to know you and see what kind of um, treatments that would be good for you and stuff like that. Uh, so it's again, it's the first thing that you cover in the appointment. It shows uh, more about your background as well, uh, which is very important because if your upbringing influenced the ways that you are today, then that is very important for the counselor to know. Uh, it helps the counselor know how to diagnose, if applicable, not every counselor does a diagnosis, and plan a treatment plan. So this is Mason's initial assessment. Uh, it goes over sleep and how many hours he had per night, his appetite, um, and it's very important, I did learn on this, to do quotes. Because if you are going through insurance, insurance will want to know the direct quotes that the client said. Uh, because it will help with fees and everything. Um, so it, it kind of just goes through his history and um, how he feels and it, it sets up a basis of where the counselor uh, can start. And it's a few pages long. And then also, um, the goals for therapy, a lot of the time they say, I don't know. Um, because they don't really think about that. They just think, oh, this counselor will go in and help me. Um, but it's very important for the counselor to set up some goals with the client because otherwise there's not really any direction that the counseling sessions would take. Um, and they do need to be very specific goals as well. Uh, next we took a Beck's depression inventory. Uh, this was created by Aaron T. Beck and it's a 21 question multiple choice self-report inventory. It's one of the most widely used instruments for measuring the severity of depression. So here's Mason's Beck inventory. Uh, and it just says like, oh, I do feel sad. I am not particularly, 
particularly discouraged about the future. I feel I have failed more than the average person. I get as much satisfaction out of things as I used to. I don't feel particularly guilty. I don't feel I am being punished. I am disappointed in myself. I blame myself all the time for my faults. I blame myself for everything bad that happens. I don't have any thoughts of killing myself. I cry more now than I used to. I am quite annoyed or irritated a good deal of the time. I have lost most of my interest in other people. I make decisions as, about as well as I ever could. I don't feel that I look worse than I used to. I can work w about as well as before. I can sleep as well as usual. I don't get tired more easily than I used to, and my appetite is no worse than usual, and I haven't lost much, much weight, if any, lately. I am no more worried about my health than usual. I have not noticed any recent change in my interest in sex. And then, so basically, you give this um, inventory to the, to the client, they fill it out, and at the end, you uh, score it all up. And so, the score reflects uh, just kind of a rough estimate of the level of depression that they might have. So Mason ended up having mild mood disturbance. Uh, next we have the Burns Anxiety Inventory. And this is an assessment tool that is used to measure anxiety. It was developed by psychiatrist David Burns. And the inventory or checklist can be self-administered or administered by a clinician. It can help people monitor their own anxiety over time and become more aware of symptoms. So this is a little more um, like all squished together, but basically you read the categories, uh, anxious feelings, anxious thoughts, physical symptoms, and you circle uh, zero, which is not at all, or three, which is a lot. Um, well, there's also one and two, but those are, it's just more of a gradient type of thing. And so again, you total up all of the numbers, and at the end, Mason got a 33, which is, uh, it falls under the severe category. So he has minor depression, severe anxiety. And oftentimes, I learned that anxiety and depression feed off of each other. Um, so one could cause the other. So next, we created a treatment plan for Mason Freeman. Um, and after the initial assessment, but before the counseling sessions is when this happens. Um, the, counsel <laughs> the, <laughs> the counselor must come up with some sort of treatment plan um, in order for the counselling sessions to have direction. The treatment plan is composed by putting together what was discovered from the initial assessment as well as information from the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So here's our treatment plan for Mason. Um, we typed it out and we have to have the, um, the client's mom sign it again because he's only 16 and he is a minor. Uh, so we, we said his history, his diagnosis, which we said was a general, generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, his treatment issues, we didn't do any uh, tests or assessments uh, from the psychiatrist or anything. And then we put his therapy goals, which was to manage anxiety, stop usage of marijuana, and coping skills for his depression. Uh, his treatment methods, we were going to use cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, talk therapy, and mindfulness. Um, so nothing too out of the ordinary, just pretty much let's, let's talk it over and let's get a plan for you. Um, we said that he would meet weekly and that we would start with about eight sessions and see where to go from there. And we said that some of them would be individual and some of them would be family sessions. So next, a counselor must have a contact log with every time they see a client. Um, this is also important with dealing with insurance uh, because they can see how often you meet, um, what kind of meeting it was and what time it was. Um, this helps to assess when a session was, who it was with, etc. So here's our contact log for Mason Freeman. Uh, we had our intake session and then we had a few individual sessions and then a family session where we brought in his whole family and we discussed basically what we were all going over because that's very important for the parents to not be blind in the sessions either, especially since he's a minor again. Um, so then we did a few more individual, a few, and then another family session, and then we did one more individual session and decided that his goals had been met, so we terminated um, his sessions. 
Basically what this means is that he can still come back if he feels like he needs to, but it doesn't need to be weekly anymore because he's doing much better. So at each, um, at each counseling session that you have, you do a progress worksheet. Uh, this assesses mood, effect, presentation, cognition, risk assessment, critical impairment, diagnosis, goals for treatment, and homework. There's not always homework, but sometimes there is. Uh, so here is one of our um, one of our assessments, and basically we just put his themes were chemical use, relationship, and family, school, and his mood. Uh, you under critical impairment, uh, there's certain levels, and so we did put three, which is severe for anxiety because of his high score on his anxiety test. Uh, we put one for depressed mood because that was it was more of a normal. Um, there's ups and downs in life and he was maybe just in a down it was not anything to worry about uh, and then we also put a one for substance abuse because he did say that he um, he uses marijuana about once a week um, but he's not addicted to it in, or anything he just uses it to kind of calm down uh, so we did diagnose Mason because my mentor is the type of uh, counselor that she does like to diagnose she said that that does help with insurance um, it just helps to keep everything in the clear uh, so we did diagnose him with a generalized anxiety disorder and we wrote down the assessments that we used and then some goals and then his homework was just to have some breathing exercises which isn't anything like huge it's just more of like a hey you need to be working on this outside of counseling as well as inside of counseling so again um, this was another um, this was actually the last one that we did for him and so you can see that we did zero to one on anxiety zero to one on depressed and there's not even anything on substance abuse anymore. Um, so he, you can see that from the very first assessment to the very last assessment, there was a drastic change for the good. So next we have my final product. Um, and for my final product, my mentor and I decided that it would be interesting to actually hold an intake session um, with an initial assessment as well on a friend of mine who does battle with depression and anxiety. Uh, we would videotape it and then create of a, script, a script of the entire session, which includes dialogue, body language, and actions for me to analyze, but we're going to keep it all anonymous um, so that everyone's like comfortable with everything. And we came up with this idea um, from the original work because I wanted to see what it was like, because it's easy to make stuff up like that, it's easy to um, go off of what you did make up, but I wanted to see what it was actually like in person because it's, it's a lot different in person than it is um, when you just make it up and so it's a lot more real and so I'd like to see what happened with like actual counseling sessions and actually talking to someone because it is very different so the steps that I um, am taking to create my final product which I haven't finished yet but I will um, there weren't too many steps um, to guide me through the end but there were a few so my first step was I wanted to decide what I wanted to learn from my final product as a whole. So again, I just really wanted to make sure that I could see the difference between creating a client in my head and actually talking to someone and actually being their, counsel their counselor. My next step was to find a friend of mine who deals with anxiety, um, depression, or anything else and that would be willing to help me out and be my client, which I have found someone um, to help me out, and I'm very excited, and we're actually doing our session next week, so that'll be very interesting. Uh, the next step was to hold the intake session and the, do the initial assessment. Um, so we are gonna videotape it, and this, the session will remain anonymous, so I'm not gonna show the video um, to anybody, but I will do the script again. Um, so the reason that we videotaped it is so that I could go back and complete step four. Um, but first I just put some questions from the initial assessment down, which you did see on Mason Freeman um, on my original work. But this one's just empty. And um, something that I, that I was talking to my mentor about and that she said was very important when you're actually de dealing with someone who's real and who's actually there is that you really need to be very specific um, as well as you need to be careful with how you ask the questions to them because if you ask a question in the wrong way such as um, do you have you lost interest in normal activities that's 
I mean, that's just very vague, and you have to be very careful with the way that you ask them questions. Um, as well as, it, it's important to ask for examples. So if you say, you know, like if you have lost interest in um, your normal activities, what activities have you lost interest in? Um, and again, it's very important to use quotes uh, for insurance and just even for your own personal reference.